I've said it a couple times before, and I have to say it again. It's just great to be with you. It's uh, for me a personal pleasure to be back at Gordon College. And it's also a privilege to open God's Word with you this morning. I ask you to give your attention to the reading of God's Word in the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Just the last few verses of, of that wonderful Gospel account where Jesus meets his disciples after the resurrection. Beginning with verse 16 through the end of the chapter, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Just as in brothers in the Lord, all flesh is grass, and the beauty thereof is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but this, the word of our God, will endure forever. My wife and I were in a bookstore a couple years ago. It was a Barnes and Noble, and I went over to the uh, religion section. I'm sure many of you have an idea what those sections look like. There's a a shelf that says Christianity, there's even often a shelf that says Christian fiction, Judaism, Islam, Eastern religions, New Age. But in this particular store, there was a, a very high shelf on the bottom, and the label said, Oversized Religion. <laughs> I thought I could get a sermon out of that sometime, <laughs> because we do have an oversized religion. We have a magnificent Savior, and here at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, as he's in his final days before he ascends to heaven after the crucifixion and the resurrection, he says an amazing thing to them, the most oversized job description you will ever hear, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. You know, that notion of all authority in heaven and on earth is a, a slight reduction of a, of a three-level description of authority that we find elsewhere in the Scriptures, Philippians 2, for example. But because he entered into our condition, taking, up, taking upon himself the form of a servant, and he went to the cross and he was raised up, and now God has highly exalted him, that at the name of Jesus, someday every knee should bow and every tongue should confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. Those three levels of authority are the, in the ancient world were, were viewed as, in very real ways as the three levels of authorities in the universe. The, the heavenly realm for many in the ancient world, it was really the angelic realm or po populated by something like angels or, or ruling spirits. On the earth were the visible authorities, those who were exercising power in a very visible way, people with real names and bodies uh, exercising power in various spheres of, of human life. And then the under the earth was the, the powers of the underworld, the, the spooky stuff, uh, the spirits, uh, the departed of the departed and the like. And we find those same levels of authority mentioned, for example, in the, the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. You know, there's this scenario in the courts of heaven, and they've discovered this scroll. Now, we're not always quite sure exactly what is referred to by the scroll, but at the very least we know this, that if you know what's in the scroll, you know the narrative plot. You, you know about the ending. You know how it's all going to end up. 
And if you don't know what's in the scroll, for all you know, it's a bunch of disconnected, chaotic events that's really heading nowhere good. And so the word goes forth into the heavens. Who is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals? And I say this as a Presbyterian. They're good Presbyterians, so they set up a search committee. And the search committee comes back with a negative report. They said, we've searched in heaven, we've searched on earth, and we've searched under the earth, and no one is found who can take the scroll and to open its seals. They, they, they checked out the angelic realm. But uh, Michael the archangel could not take the scroll and to open its seals, and Gabriel could not. None of the cherubim or the seraphim could take the scroll to open its seals. The angel Moroni, who stands atop every Mormon temple, he is not able to take the scroll and to open its seals. So then they checked on the earth. You know, the book of Revelation begins with John saying, bringing greetings from the one who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who's the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. And in ancient times, the emperors, the kings, queens, empresses had charge of really all the, the sphere. They exercised authority over all the, the earthly spheres of, of cultural interaction. The emperor was the the leading politician, but he also ruled over the games. He ruled over the marketplace. He ruled over the military. He ruled over the, the kinship system and the, the system of religious worship. And today we have a much more fragmented uh, areas of uh, different spheres of life where we have different visible authorities. So if we imagine that scenario today, they. Uh, they checked with Mr. Obama, and he was not able to take the scroll and to open its seals. They checked with the South Korean parliament. No one there could take the scroll to open its seals. The, the leaders of the Israeli government, the Governor Patrick of the state of Massachusetts, the, the General Secretary of the UN, none of them were able to take the scroll and to open its seals. But not just those political leaders, but the editors of the Wall Street Journal could not open the scroll. Uh, judges on American Idol could not open the scroll. No one at CNN or NBC or Fox News could take the scroll. And try as he might, using all of his resources, Charlie Sheen could not take the scroll <laughs> and to open its seals. So then they went under the earth. No zombie, no vampire, no character in any Stephen King novel, no demon, no ogre, no... None of those powers of the underworld could take the scroll to open its seals. And John says, I wept. Because if that's the final report of the search committee, no one is able to reveal the secrets of history. No one is able to give us any sense of, of how things will end up. And then suddenly they announce, we found someone. The lion of the tribe of Judah, of the, of the root of David, he is able to take the scroll and to open its seals. And when John looks, he does not see a lion, but he sees a lamb that was slain. And at that point, there's this wonderful hymn that breaks forth in the courts of heaven. Worthy are you, O Lord, to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed women and men for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you have made us a kingdom and priests unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Jesus, the Lamb of God, is able to take the scroll and to open its seals. And that's what he's telling his disciples here at the end of Matthew. Yeah. All authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth has been given unto me. Let's think about that a little bit. Just two points this morning. One is, what are the credentials that he has? Yeah. On what basis does he he make this claim, makes this claim. And there's something a bit mysterious here. You know, he says this, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. We find the same reference in Philippians too. He has been given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. In one sense, he had it all along. 
This is the eternal word become flesh by whom and through whom and all things, through whom all things were made. He had it from the very beginning. He is the, the creator God appearing in the flesh. And yet at this point, he says, it has been given unto me. And I believe he was holding out his nail pierced hands at that point. And it's so important for us to be thinking about this on this first day of the Lenten season. As this morning, he holds out his nail-pierced hands and says to us, don't you see all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me because I've gone to the cross, because I am the lamb that was slain. We're talking here about the authority of the risen Lord, who is the lamb who was slain, who shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, doing for us and for the whole creation something that none of us could ever do for ourselves. It has been given unto him. In some mysterious way, the authority of Jesus Christ has been added unto him as he went from being the Logos to also being the Lamb, as he went from being the eternal Son of God, sitting at the right hand of the Father from all eternity, to being the crucified one and the risen one who can stretch out his hands to his disciples and say, all oh, authority in heaven and as on earth has been given unto me. He earned that throughout his lifetime. He earned that already. He began to earn it already in the manger at Bethlehem. He earned it by going through what the apostle tells us in the epistle to the Hebrews, that, that we have a great high priest who knows what it's like to be us because he suffered like us. He's been tempted in every way that we've been tempted. And then he took all of that to the cross on our behalf bringing about the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him as the Lamb of God. Then the next question is this. What does it require of us to acknowledge on this first day of Lent that he is the one to whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been given? He presented it originally to his disciples in ancient Palestine, but he also gives it to us here this morning on this campus of Gordon College. And it's not just a story about the past, but it's a command that's given to us here in the present. Well, let me suggest a couple things. And we do have to acknowledge that authority. That's what this college is all about, under the kingship, under the rule of Jesus Christ, who is also the Lamb of God. We engage in our studies in various disciplines, in various projects, in various outreach works that we engage in. And we need to acknowledge it. So I wrote a book a couple years ago called Praying at Burger King. And here's how I got the title. I went with a friend of mine, and we were visiting in a city, and we went to Burger King for lunch. Crowded Burger King. We had to stand a long time in line. We got up there, we each ordered the same thing. We ordered Whopper with cheese, fries, and then not to feel too guilty, we ordered a Diet Coke. <laughs> we took it back, found a place to sit, little kids running around, smell of French fries in the air, noisy place, and each of us bowed our heads quietly and, and prayed. And as we started to eat, my friend said to me, you ever think about how weird it is to pray at Burger King, it's kind of hard to get in the mood to pray at Burger King, especially this one here, given all the stuff that's going on around us. And I thought about that for a while. And I decided it's a good idea to pray at Burger King. You know, suppose you're in the mall and you, uh, you see somebody coming toward you. You hadn't seen her for a long time. You really like that person. You had a lot of good experiences together in the past. You don't say to yourself, you know, she's coming and I've been thinking about, I've got to go to Macy's and do something and all the rest. And suddenly I see her and I haven't really thought about her for a long time. I haven't talked to her for a long time. I think I should find a quiet place and just think about her for a while. Uh, remember all of my experiences with her in the past, all of the things that I feel good about regarding the times that we've had together so that I really get in the right mood and I can say in all honesty and with great legitimate enthusiasm, hey, it's really good to see you. You don't do that. You don't have time to do that. You don't really have to do that. All you need to do is go up to the person and say, hey, good to see you. And you know why you do it? Because she's there. 
And you don't have to get in the right kind of mood to pray to God. You can pray to God at Burger King, and the only thing you really need to tell him is you're here. And you own Burger King. You own Kelly's. You own Dunkin' Donuts. You own the Boston Red Sox. You own Gordon College. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto you, and we need regularly in different places and in different ways to bow our heads and to acknowledge that he is the Lord and the ruler over the places in which we live our daily lives. So important. So we need to acknowledge his authority. And then we really need to claim it. I had a friend, African-American pastor, who moved into a city where I happened to be visiting, and he had just taken up a new church congregation. And I ran into him, and I said, hey, how's it going? He said, you know, it's just, just terrific. He said, I haven't preached a sermon yet in the new church. I haven't met a lot of the people. All I've been doing for the last two weeks is walking around the ghetto claiming the territory for Jesus. That's a profound act. It's a very important thing for us to do, to go into the lab today and claim that territory for Jesus, to go into the library and claim that territory for Jesus, to go into the gym and claim that territory for Jesus, to go back to our local congregations and claim that territory for Jesus. Because Jesus requires that we constantly acknowledge the fact that he is the Lord and ruler over all things, including everything and every place where we find ourselves in our daily lives. Another thing it requires of us is that we struggle with what it means for our sense of Christian identity. You know, I love that chapter, Revelation 5, and that hymn. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed every human being, you, you, you ransomed women and men, for God from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. We talked about this the other night, but in the Old Testament, God set up an ethnocentric covenant. He chose out of the, the many nations and tribes. I was, I was speaking to a Jewish audience. I'm a Calvinist, I got to admit that right off. Uh, I, I was speaking to a, a Jewish audience, and my rabbi friend introduced me, and he said, Richard Mao is going to talk to us tonight, and I want you to know two things about Richard Mao. Uh, he's a Calvinist, but he's also a good guy. You know? <laughs> and I gave my talk, and afterward, this elder, elderly Jewish couple came up to me, and they said, Dr. Mao, we really appreciate what you had to say tonight, but did Rabbi Dorf say that you're a Calvinist? And I said, yeah, and they said, well, that kind of surprises us. And I said, what's so surprising about that? They said, well, like, don't you Calvinists believe that, that God chooses some and not others? And I said, yeah, like God chose the people of Israel and not the Philistines or the Midianites or the Amicalites. They looked at me really strange, and they said, oh, that gives us something to think about, and walked away. <laughs> yeah. But in the Old Testament, God chose one people out of the many peoples and nations and tribes of the earth. And and the only way to become, a, become right with God in the Old Testament was either to be born a Jew or go through the process, the ritual process of becoming a Jew. Because this was the time of the curse of Babel, where God established the boundaries of the nations in such a way that the tongues were confused so that uh, human beings would no longer try to build their universal towers uh, into the heavens. But the marvelous thing is that from the very beginning, the Lord God, in choosing Israel, said, this isn't the final picture, but someday I will prepare a feast on the house of the mountain of the Lord, and, and all nations shall gather for that feast. And that's what began to be happened at Pentecost, which was the reversal of Babel. You know, Babel was the wrong kind of multiculturalism. It was a, a multiculturalism where people couldn't talk to each other, where people couldn't cooperate with each other. It was a, a multiculturalism of a kind of grand apartheid scheme. But at Pentecost, God undid the curse of Babel because on that day of Pentecost, people from different nations speaking different languages 
in great surprise, turned to each other and said, did we not each of us hear in our own language the same message, that there is a God who has sent Jesus Christ into the world and is now pouring out his spirit on people from tribes and tongues and nations of the earth. And part of what it means, a very important part of what it means for us to be disciples of Jesus Christ is to acknowledge that we are being absorbed into a multicultural, multinational, multilingual community drawn from the tribes and tongues and peoples of the earth and have been given a new identity in Jesus Christ. And it's an identity like many of the other identities is based on blood. But my new identity has nothing to do with ultimately with the fact that I have Dutch ethnic blood flowing in my veins or that sometimes I like to think of myself as a red-blooded American male or Sometimes I rightly gather to celebrate the, the fact that the blood of men and women has been shed on the battlefields of the world. Those are good things to reflect upon. They're good things to care about. But ultimately, what identifies me is that I have new kinfolk because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that I've been drawn into a new kind of community from every tribe and tongue and nation of the earth. And we need to grow into that identity told some of you the other evening that I went to North Korea uh, the summer before last for five days. Went there with Don Chang, the owner of the Forever, Forever 21 chain. And he had donated food in the northern part of North Korea. And we actually went there to see that those, those starving people, little children who had been dying, had in fact received the, the flour and the corn and the cooking oil. Each of those units had on it a cross, had on written it on it, love your neighbor as yourself. And we made, went to make sure that it was being distributed. And we went back to Pyongyang and on a Sunday morning, we went to one of what we were told was one of the five legally sanctioned worship services in the, in the country of North Korea. Wonderful little brick church planted by Presbyterian missionaries early in the 20th century. And we had a wonderful service. As I walked into that service, the North Korean choir was singing. Jesus paid it all. They were singing in Korean, but we had multilingual, bilingual hymn books, and we knew what they were singing. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. Later on, they sang, leaning on the other everlasting arms. And I came away from that service with a sense that I have kinfolk in North Korea. And never again, I, I gotta tell you a story. You know, my predecessor in the presidency at Fuller always said, and I thought it was a good line, but I also thought it was kind of a hyperbolic line. You can't drop down any place in the world without being too far from a Fuller graduate. I'm walking down the aisle of the church afterward, after I'd spoken. This young Korean man reaches out, takes my arm, and he says, Dr. Mao, what are you doing here? I said, who are you? He said, I'm a graduate of Fuller Seminary. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I can't tell you. <laughs> but I came away from that service with a promise to God that never again will I hear the words North Korea without thinking of the fact that I have sisters and brothers in Jesus Christ, that I have kinfolk and that there, I am with them a part of a community that God is drawing from the tribes and tongues and nations of the earth. And I don't know what that means for American foreign policy, but I do know that when I hear about an earthquake or when I hear about a landslide or I hear about flooding or I hear about a, a nuclear test, when I hear that, that leader of North Korea rattling the sword, I need to pray for my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ who are North Koreans. And that's so important for us to grow into that identity, that our real citizenship, even though we can have affection for the places that have nurtured us, the nations and tribes and peoples, that our true identity is that we are members of a community, citizens of a kingdom drawn from every tribe and tongue and people and nation of the earth. One of the earliest documents of of the early church after the New Testament is a, something called the Epistle to Diognetus. I think it was written by a Christian leader to a Roman official not too long after the death of the apostles uh, explaining this newfound religion of following Jesus uh, to a pagan 
a Roman official. You can find it online, the epistle to Diognetus. There's one great line in it where he's explaining Christianity to a Roman official, and he says, for those of us who are Christians, every homeland is a foreign country, and every foreign country is a homeland. We're going to need to live with that tension. North Korea is now one of my homelands because I've got kinfolk there. And the United States of America, which is my homeland also, is also kind of a foreign country to me. Because as much as I know that I'm called to respect the authorities, the visible authorities here in the United States, that my true allegiance, ultimately true allegiance, is to Jesus Christ, the one who said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And that tells us a lot about how we're to view the world in which we're called to serve. You know, I talked about this in earlier lectures here, that we're a beholding people, we're a world viewing people. And it's so important for us to, to see people. One of my favorite spiritual writers is uh, Saint Teresa of Lisieux. She's a saint of the Catholic Church, but she was actually one of my saints even before they decided to name her a saint. She has a wonderful little book of devotions, diary of a journal, journal of a, of a, a diary of a saint, or something like that. Anyway, Teresa of Lisieux. And uh, she, at 15 years old, she wanted to become a Carmelite nun. It was against the rules. She pestered her bishop. Finally, her bishop sent her to Rome, and the pope gave in, let her go in at an early age. And it was a good thing, too, because she died before she was 30. But she regularly wrote these devotional pieces that are just marvelous pieces. But at one point, she says, Lord, Lord Jesus, there's this one nun I can't stand. Maybe some of you are talking, thinking about roommates here or sweet mates or something. But uh, there's this one, uh, nun, there's one other nun here in the convent. I can't stand her. And I'm sure it's the devil who's uh, inspiring this kind of antagonism between us. And she said, I've decided that, uh, that, that I need to pray to you about it. And when I'm praying to you about it, I remember that you are the divine artist and that every artist likes people to appreciate his work of art, even if it's been kind of wounded a bit or, or, or marred. And Lord Jesus, I know you're the artist who created that. She's her, your work of art. And I've been working to get beyond the surface into the deeper places where I understand her and I can see the beauty that you intended for, for her as the artist who created her. Yeah. She's engaging in a kind of beholding, a kind of world viewing that goes beneath the surfaces there. For some of us, art appreciation comes uh, rather difficult, with rather much difficulty. For others, it comes easy. But seeing the world, seeing other human beings, even in their brokenness, even in their rebellion and their woundedness, is to see a work of divine art. And we need to train ourselves to nurture in ourselves the capacity for beholding that which is not always obvious on the surfaces. So it's how we see the world when we acknowledge that the one Jesus is the one to whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given. I, uh, I like uh, to read thriller novels. Uh, you know, you know what I mean? It's the, uh, it's the Thomas, uh, it, it's the Robert Ludlum kind of novel, Tom Clancy, Robert Ludlum, you know. I, I read those for kind of downtime. Uh, they're not too demanding intellectually, but they're just kind of a good read, a good relax, eh, kind of stressful at times read. You know how it goes. The novel has 460 pages and you get to page 230 and you can be pretty sure that around 230 is going to be something like this. They're heroes in a house surrounded by the enemy. It doesn't look like he's going to get out alive. And the woman he loves is being held captive someplace. Now, at that point, you, get, you feel kind of the stress of the situation, you know. So I tell you what I do. I go to the last page. I, I don't read it very carefully. I just kind of scan it. All I want to do is find out two things. One, that he's still alive. And secondly, that the two of them are together again. And then I could go back from page 460 to page 230 
And it's still a, a, a stressful read. It's still a, an exciting experience. But I can slowly work my way through the plot from 230 to 460, and I can do it with a kind of underlying confidence because I've seen the last page. And I've got good news for you this morning. I've seen the last page, and you have too. And this is what the last page says. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and on earth and under the earth that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The last page tells us this, that, that there is coming a time when Jesus Christ will appear once again and he will declare over the whole creation, behold, I make all things new. And when that happens, there isn't going to be any rebel California cop shooting other cops. Nobody's going to be burning down cabins where a criminal is, uh, is, is, is hiding. And no one is going to be worried about long-range budget problems. No one is going to be learning, worrying about cancer or AIDS or, or, or heart attacks. There's not going to be any more child abuse. There's not going to be any more sexual slavery. There's not going to be any more poverty. There'll be no more ghettos or barrios or reservations. In that day, all will be well with the whole creation. And we're still on page 230. And I don't have a lot of easy answers. I don't know how we're going to get there. And you may be bringing issues and concerns this morning to this chapel service where you don't know how you're going to get there either. But I'm going to tell you, you're going to get there if you trust in Jesus Christ, because I've seen the last page. And he's coming again, and he will make all things new. And it will be well for each of us who have put our trust in Jesus Christ from all eternity. Lord God, I thank you that Jesus Christ is the one to whom all authority in heaven and earth has been given. And I pray for each person here this morning that they may hear once again the assurance that uh, we're on our way to the last page, that the Lamb is worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals that the book will be laid open and that we will know even as we're known. And in the meantime, I ask for each person here that you will, uh, on page 230, uh, speak to us in our hopes and our fears, our worries, our expectations, and assure us that because of Jesus Christ, you have done something for us that we could never do for ourselves and that we are indeed on our way to your glorious kingdom with your call that we be agents of that kingdom here and now until Jesus comes again. And I pray this in his powerful name. Amen.